our paper, Scalable Computations of Water Stanberry Center, via Input Convex Neural Networks. I present this on behalf of the, of the collaborators Amir Tagave and Yongxin Chen. Our motivation is to average several marginal distributions. However, what's a good metric? Here is a simple example. There are three different Gaussian marginal distributions. Those small hills represent their probability density, mu1, mu2, and mu3. The higher it is, the smaller variance it has. If we simply sum up mu1, mu2, and mu3 and divide by 3, we could get a Gaussian mixture distribution. And these Gaussian components would have the same mean as before, but a smaller variance. This is not what we want. In many cases, we hope the average distribution could inherit the modality from the marginal distributions. Fortunately, by using Washington distance, we could achieve as this. The minimizer of some of the stand distance to all the marginal distributions will share the same modality as marginal distributions. And this is what we call Washington Berry Center. Some of the existing methods are over discrete space and as such doesn't scale to high dimensional settings. Some other free support methods allow support atoms free to move, but they are computationally highly expensive when the number of support points is large. Our method targets at solving Washington Barry Center over continuous space as well as in high dimension. Match, uh, Washington metric is originally a concept in the optimal transport theory. Optimal transport theory is a powerful tool in the study of probability distributions. It dates back to 1781. The French engineer Monge aimed to find an optimal strategy to move soil to road construction sites. So the Monge formulation is to minimize the integral cost when you transport mass from distribution nu to mu by optimal, uh, by optimal map t. t is always so-called Monge map. And C is the cost here. Mount formulation can be EU post because sometimes there is no map specifying the T push forward and nu is mu. For example, when nu is Dirac measure, but the mu is not. And in 1940, the Soviet mathematician Kantorovich develops a more general and practical formulation. Instead of seeking for a Mount map, it seeks for an optimal joint distribution between marginal nu and the mu to minimize the transport cost. And if we specify the cost to be the square of Euclidean distance, Kantorovich formulation is exactly the squared Washington 2 distance. But the Washington 2 distance itself is an optimization problem. How to solve it? Kantorovich develops a dual problem, which optimizes over two functions, phi and psi, with some constraints. It can be proved that the strong duality holds here. This brings us much convenience. We can continue and let fx to be half of x norm square minus phi x, and f prime to be half of y norm square minus phi y. Then the contorvic dual problem boils down to uh, capital C nu mu minus infimum of expectation fx plus expectation f prime y. Based on this formulation, we could derive the semi-dual formulation of optimal transport. It could be noticed that the optimal f prime is achieved at f star, which is the convex conjugate function of f, and the optimal f is a convex function. This reduces the searching area for us. Um, also, a very, a very important result is that the gradient of f star is the optimal map from mu to nu, and the gradient of f is the opposite direction map. This means once we solve the semi dual problem, we get the bi directional maps as well. However, this f star is still tricky in practice because we don't know how to parameterize it easily. So we rewrite f star in this supremal formula, and it could be proved that the optimal g is exactly optimal f star, and the g is a convex function. 
Thus, we got our final dual formula of water stand two distance just by plugging in this explicit form of F star. The highlighted trunk in this capital V is exactly F star. However, how do we constrain this F and G to be convex? Fortunately, a recent proposed method called Input Convex Neural Network could solve this. We call Input Convex Neural Networks ICNN for shorthand. ICNN defines a convex map from X to ZL. As shown in this picture, ICNN structure is composed by two roots. Each layer output ZL plus one is equal to WL, ZL plus AL, X, BL, uh, followed by an elevation function sigma. And this map is guaranteed to be convex if uh, W1 to WL minus one are non-negative, sigma zero to sigma L minus one are convex, and sigma one to sigma L minus one are non-decreasing. In fact, um, until now, we have all our tools ready. Let's see how to use them to solve the barrier center problem. Actually, all the barrier center problem is defined in a trivial way. It's just the minimizer of weighted summation of water stand distance to all the marginal distributions. Sum from R is, R is 1 to N, AL water stand 2 distance between nu and mu i. Mu i is the ith marginal distributions. And in practice, our method actually doesn't need to be uh, get access to the probability density of marginal distributions. Instead, we only require samples from them. This makes our method more practical because in many cases, we only have samples from marginal distributions, like uh, the subset posterior aggregation. We only have a bunch of samples given by the MCMC Bayesian inference. And it's time to plug in the water stand two distance formula to get our final target. Our full formula for solving water stand barrier center is this mean max mean problem. We could solve this problem in three loops and perform stochastic gradient descent in each loop. In practice, we use a generator H to generate the samples X from our estimated barrier center. And the input to H is samples from a trivial distribution, such as standard Gaussian. This guarantees that we could sample from estimate barrier center as many as we want. And the convex function sets are parameterized by fully uh, input convex neural networks. Uh, other than the loss from last slide, we add one more loss, R theta gi. This is because we loosen the constraint of non-negative weights in GI and add a penalty instead. This could speed up the training process. <coughs> then a natural question is how to recover the barrier center. In other words, how to sample from it. In fact, there are two ways to sample from it. One is through the generator edge. Another is through a gradient of GI because it's the optimal mount map from marginal di distributions to the barrier center. However, gradient of GI couldn't give infinite number of samples if the samples from marginal distribution are limited. Next, we show our experimental results for our method. In 2D and 3D spaces, each row is an example. The first example is a ring and a square. The second is two blocks, and the third is two digits. From these examples, we could see that the gradient of G would inherit more artifacts from the marginal distributions. Especially in this third row, gradient of GI exhibits a pixelated uh, shape. And in blocks example, gradient of GI gives more regular cubes. This is an advantage of it because we hope barrier center more or less share the same property as marginal distributions. Another example is the color palette averaging. We take each pixel RGB value out as a 3D data, and each image contains around 2 million pixels. So there are three marginal distributions, and each one is an empirical distribution 
can, composed by 2 million equal weighted samples. For these six pictures, the left shows the original images, and the right shows pixel-wise uh, push-forward images. The barycenter effect makes the three uh, color palette sort of merging together. The barycenter effect makes uh, first picture uh, the leaves become greener and darker. The sunbeams in the second picture become more red. And the sky in the last picture receives an orange color toning. The plot in the right shows the RGB cloud to visualize the color palette of images. This slide shows our method also perform well on sharp geometries such as lines and ellipses. The module distribution is some one-dimension manifold such as line or ellipse. We compare with the stochastic Washington Barry Center, but it has some difficulty in giving more samples due to expensive computation. When it goes to higher dimension, the scalability is also promised. Our method is on par with continuous Washington Barry Center without a minimax. And the fast free support Washington Barry Center is very stable, but the error is large compared to us. The continuous regularized Washington Barry Center becomes very unstable in high dimension. In this MNIST example, the first marginal is an empirical distribution of digital zero samples, and the second marginal is of digital one. Both of our algorithm and the continuous Washington Barry Center without a minimax give reasonable results. We also try to fuse MNIST and the USPS. MNIST digits are skinny and the USPS are kind of bold. The barrier center digit absorbs both of their features, so it's neither too skinny nor too bold. Next, I would like to introduce another function of our method. It could work as a GAN. When there is only one marginal, the barrier center is equal to another marginal. So through generator, we could generate as many samples as we want from that marginal distribution. It's very similar to Washington GAN, but we are minimizing the Washington 2 metric. A more inspiring result is that we could recover multiple marginal distributions after one training. That's because gradient of Fi is the map from barrier center to the ith marginal. So we could input the samples Z from standard Gaussian into H to get the barrier center samples, then input into gradient of F to get samples from marginal distributions. Let's look at some examples. We compare with the Washington GAN, Washington GAN with gradient penalty, and the recent Washington 2 generative networks. For Gaussian mixture, we could avoid the mode collapse very well. For MNIST, we use MLP to train and also give reasonable results. This is a 784 dimension example. Note that the W2 generative network was tested originally on MNIST dataset in their paper, but the optimal transport is addressed in the feature or latent space, which dimension is much lower than 784. So that's the possible reason it doesn't perform well here. As for multiple marginals, we can take a look at this 0-1 digit example. After one training, we recover digits 0 and 1 well. This is wonderful because normally GAN sets only one distribution as the learning target and can only recover one distribution after training. But we can learn multiple distributions after a single training process. We also test multiple marginal generative model on MNIST and USPS example. After one training, we recover both of MNIST and the USPS distributions. This example is harder than the zero one digit example because each distribution contains zero to nine digits. So its modality is much more complex and we can still recover them quite well. Note that uh, in all of these examples, we only use MLP networks. So it's a possible direction to add a convolutional neural networks or transformer 
to deal with higher quality images. These are all our examples. The final takeaway is that our method requires only samples from marginal distributions, and we could recover as many barycenter samples as we wish because we have a generator. Also, we could generate all the marginal distribution samples after one training. Okay, thank you. Here are our archive link and GitHub code link. If you have any questions, please contact me or stop by our poster.